experience and we thank God for our pastor and founder the Reverend Dr. F. James Clark. Let us pray. Gracious and eternal God how excellent is your name in all the earth. We simply pray now that you would bless this worship experience, anoint our hearts, anoint our minds, that we would hear from you. Bless us this bless us we pray in Jesus name. Amen and thank God. Hallelujah.
glory. Glory to his name. Hallelujah. How many of you know he is worthy to be lifted up? Hallelujah. And we bless his name on this morning. Amen. Let's receive our scripture reading. Good morning and shalom. shalom. Our passage of scripture can be found in Philippians chapter 4, verses 4 through 7. And I will be reading from the New International Version of the Bible. Rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again. Rejoice. Yes. Let your gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is near. Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. This is the word of God, and I do believe it to be true. The grass withers and the flowers thereof may fade away. But the word of our God shall stand forever. Amen. 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 Good morning, Shalom. To join with us in our hymn this morning, My God is Real. How many of you can witness that God is a real God? Yeah. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Verse 1 There are some things.
Amen. We thank God that we serve a real God. He's real in our soul. And that's our that's our true confession. Despite what others may say, we know that God is God is real. Amen. We thank God for the truth of that powerful hymn of the church. Again, we praise God for being real in our lives. Before we move to our prayer period, we have a couple of announcements this morning, as well as a, another ministry presentation to be shared in this service. First, we will have Vanessa Savoy, followed by Minister Ethel Bindham. Let's receive them as they come. Praise God. Good morning and shalom, family. I come this morning to uh, invite a lot of you guys to my virtual workout classes. We used to work out here at Shalom, but with the virus and everything closing down, everybody had to kind of stay at home. So uh, we're now offering a way for you to continue to stay healthy by offering these virtual workout classes. Now, the class will consist of weight training, core work, and low impact cardio. You'll need a couple of pounds of weights. If you don't have any weights, get you some water bottles, a couple of canned goods, that'll work. You might need a chair if you don't want to go on the floor with a mat, and a towel and some water. The routines can be modified or intensified, depending on your level of mobility or range of motion. You can find these classes on our Shalom website, just click on the ministry down drop, down drop button, then click on find a ministry, click on the Kananiya ministry, where you'll find the athletic ministry. It's an underlined red line under there. Click that box and it will lead you to the virtual classes. We have them on Monday, Wednesday, and Friday nights. Thank you so much, and I would it be an honor for me if you would log in and work out with me so we can all lose these pounds and keep our physical fitness. And again, thank you, Pastor Clark, for always thinking about all of your people. The class times are 6 o'clock on Monday night, 11 a.m. on Wednesday, so, that the, so you can work out either time. If you're at work, you can do nights or you can do afternoons. And then on Friday nights, we just kind of get together and have us at like a dance party. And that's at 6 o'clock. So again, you are all invited. Please give me the honor to be your instructor. I thank you and shalom. Good morning and shalom. Shalom, I'm just as excited as I was on last week to come before you with the announcement of the Shalom Souls to the Poles voting event. Amen? Amen. Next, uh, not next Saturday, but Saturday, October the 24th, we will be meeting here at the Shalom parking lot at 8.30 a.m. What we want to do is that we want to line up and caravan through North County to get out a get out the vote message. Amen. We're asking you to do signage to encourage our community that they are part of this and we need them to vote. So again, if we, you can meet us here at 830 on Saturday, October the 24th then we will depart to go to the election board. The great thing about it is that all we will need to do is travel straight up Lindbergh South to the election board. Not a lot of turns, none of those type of things. So we want to do this in a very, very organized way. And what we really want to do, not only again to encourage the community, but encourage you to vote as a family. Many are saying I've already voted and we know that is awesome because that's what we need you to do. We need you to get to the polls. But if you've already voted, maybe there's someone in your household that hasn't voted. 
Maybe there's another uh, relative that hasn't voted that you feel safe with riding in the car with you. Bring them along. We really are asking uh, Shalom members and our young people who are 18 to 30 years of age, please join us. Please bring your friends and all those who you know have registered to this event. We want to make a statement. Yes, we do. We're not doing this just to be doing it. We're doing this because not only do we want to be active, then we want the community and our family to be active. Now, Shalom, we have an opportunity to make a change. We have an opportunity to make a positive change in your household, in your, with your neighbor, and with your community. I want to say thank you for Pastor, to Pastor Clark. Shalom, Pastor Clark has allowed information, announcements, voter registration, voter education for the last four to five years. We voted, we have came back, we found out more, we registered more. Now it's time for us to move to another level. I believe that we were preparing for such a time as this. We must vote. We must vote. We must vote. And not only should we vote, we need to make sure that as many people as possible that are connected to us go to the polls and vote. Now I've said, if you've already voted, perhaps there is someone that you can round up to bring up that day. Don't make that an excuse for not showing up with us. We need you. This community needs you. All of the communities in which we reside probably need us to make sure that we do this. So again, I'm asking if you would join us on that day. Not only that, there are over five, 50, not five, 50,000 people who are registered in the African American community, uh, community alone that do not vote. They're registered, but don't go vote. We're asking Let's encourage them. Let's do all we can to make sure that they come out with us. We will practice safe methods. We masks are required. When you pull up in the parking lot, there will be someone to guide you with spacing. We want to make sure when we get to the election board that we do that. If, make sure you put on your mask, your gloves, is that what makes you most comfortable? Make sure we will make sure there's sanitizer, hand sanitizer, you do the same. Bring your chairs, bring your snacks to make sure that you will be able to withstand if it happens to be a long line, which we're hoping that it is. We're asking all to join us. We are just trying to initiate this process and make sure that our community votes strong and that our community votes powerful. We are able to do this. We are well equipped to carry this out and to make sure that we make our mark in this country, right here in North County, right here in St. Louis. It's time and let us go forth and do it. So again, Saturday, October the 24th, 2020, meet here at 8.30. Let's get our signage. Let's go through North County. Let's encourage North County. And let's do what we've been called to do for the kingdom. In Jesus' name, I ask and pray. Amen. Thank you and shalom. Hi, I'm Deborah Ray, and we represent the GIA Support Ministry which means God is able. We have a passion for helping hurting people through witnessing, educational resources, and prayer. We host a supportive, safe, confidential, and non-judgmental meeting. We are so grateful to God for our pastor and the leadership for affirming the need and importance of this ministry. Pastor Clark, our sister Cheryl, your family, and our entire church family, we miss you. We love you. So looking forward to fellowshipping again with you. Until then, all be safe. God bless and shalom. Hi, this is Deborah Wise. Hi, is everybody. 
Pastor, how are you doing? I pray you're well and also your family, my Shalom family as a group. I'm constantly praying for you. I hope you're well. Stay covered. Trust in the Lord. Do not waver. Shalom. Hey, Shalom family. This is Sister Green. I miss you all. I miss fellowshipping with you in Shalom Church. And of course, I miss singing in that choir. I'm praying that you are keeping your faith up and you're, and you're wearing your mask and you're washing your hands and doing all of those things that will allow us to be able to see one another again in Shalom, in fellowship. I love you, God keep you, and be safe. Hello, Shalom family, this is Lisa Golden, and I'm just wishing you all the best in this COVID season, praying that you're all safe and God keeping you. Pastor Clark, we love you and we miss you and we thank you. We thank you for your obedience and we thank you for your service unto the Lord. And we just want, cannot wait to see you in the house of the Lord. Shalom, family. I miss you. Hey, Shalom. This is Rachelle Lane Ray. Pastor Clark, I miss you. I miss fellowshipping with everyone. I am praying that everyone is staying safe and healthy during this pandemic. Continue to take care of yourselves until we can meet again at Shalom. Amen. Church, can we thank God for our support ministry this morning? Amen. Bless the Lord. And we are also grateful for the helpful information shared by our fitness instructor, Ms. Vanessa Savoy, as well as Minister Ethel Bindham regarding our early voting initiative, Souls to the Polls. To stay informed and connected to all that is happening in the life of our church family, as always, we encourage you to visit our website at shalomccop.org. Now, family, as we prepare our hearts for prayer, we are certainly mindful of the many prayer concerns that have been called into the office and shared throughout the week. And we are ever grateful for the diligence of our ministerial team in presenting our concerns before the Lord in prayer. But we have a few families that we want to lift, uh, several bereaved families this morning. We are yet praying for Tracy Tyus and family and the passing of her mother and Shalom family and staff member Dolores Tyus. Jamila Andrews and the passing of her mother and Shalom family member Sherry Andrews. For the Wright family and the passing of their loved one and Shalom family member Cecilia Wright. Benicia Boone and the passing of his sister Mary Ann McClendon. Emma McWilliams and the passing of her father, Winston Reese, father-in-law of Pam Reese and grandfather of Tierra Curry. And then church, we are also lifting up in our prayers, Renee Madison and the passing of her mother and Shalom family member, Mother Evelyn Johnson. The Bible says that we should always pray and not, and not faint. How many of you know that God still hears and answers prayer? Amen. Our music ministry will bless us once more in song as we prepare to go to God in prayer. Amen.
Let us pray. Eternal God, our Father, Father of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, how we love and how we adore you on this morning. Truly, you are the great I am. There is none like you in all of the earth. We can search high and low and not find one like you. We thank you, O oh God, for how you've kept us all week long from danger seen and unseen. We thank you, O oh Lord, in the midst of a pandemic, how you've provided every one of us needs that we have. Father, we thank you that you look beyond our faults and you keep right on supplying our every need according to your riches and glory. We come confessing our faults before you. We acknowledge that we are undone and that we are imperfect. But we thank you this morning for your perfect love. Thank you, God. That you loved us so much that you gave your only begotten son. That whosoever believes in him shall not perish, but shall have everlasting life. Yeah. And so we ask on this morning that you would create within us a clean heart. Yes, and renew within us the right spirit. Yes, Lord, restore unto us the joy of our salvation. Yes. Help us to lift you up like never before. But Father, certainly you are worthy yes. to be praised. Yeah. Father God, we thank you for how you kept our families. We thank you, oh God, for how you've kept us on the job. We thank you, oh God, for keeping our loved ones that are sick. Father God, for bereaved families, for families that are grieving everywhere. We thank you for being the God of all comfort. We pray you would wipe away every tear from our eyes. For your word says that weeping may endure for a night, but that joy comes in the morning, and that the joy of the Lord is our strength. And so we choose on this morning to give you glory, to give you honor, and to give you praise. Oh God, for those who are sick in hospital rooms, Father God, we still know that by your stripes, we are healed. So we pray for your healing power. We receive healing even now in the name of Jesus. The blood of Jesus be on our loved ones in the name of Jesus. Father, we thank you for your preached word that's coming forward. We certainly thank you for Pastor Clark. We pray that you would anoint him afresh. Let your word fall on good ground. Father, we need a word from you that you would order our steps in your word, dear Lord. Father, we need you each and every day. And so, God, we thank you for our pastor. We thank you for his family. We thank you for the entire Shalom Church family. And we thank you for supplying every need. Father, we thank you that we can do all things through Christ who gives us the strength. So many things we could ask, oh God, but you already know the very meditation of our heart. So we end our prayer knowing that you have heard us in the powerful, penetrating name of Jesus, the Christ we pray and give you thanks. Amen and thank God. Let's give God praise. Hallelujah. Glory. Glory.
they call it is. And it probably feel like the wilderness is all around you. But just turn to whoever you sit by in your house and tell them that it's only a test. This wilderness is only temporary. It's only a test. Let's minister this song this morning because somebody needs to know, including myself, that it's only a test that we're going through. It won't last always. Put your hands together. It's only a test. It's only a test. 
Hold on, be strong. It's only, it's only a test. Good morning. God's blessings upon you. We're grateful to have this opportunity to come before uh, you again. We ask God's charged blessings upon you on this day. I invite your attention to the Gospel of Mark, chapter 10, uh, verses 17 to 30. And as he was sitting, setting out on his journey, a man ran up and kneeled before him and asked him, Good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus said to him, Why do you call me good? No one is good but God alone. You know the commandments, do not kill, do not commit adultery, do not steal, do not bear false witness, do not defraud, honor your father and mother. And he said to him, Teacher, all these I have observed from my youth. And Jesus, looking upon him, loved him and said to him, You lack one thing, go, sell what you have and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven and come, follow me. At that saying, his countenance fell and he went away sorrowful, for he had great possessions. And Jesus looked around and said to his disciples how hard it will be for those who have riches to enter the kingdom of God. And the disciples were amazed at his words. But Jesus said to them again, children, how hard it is to enter the kingdom of God. It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. And they were exceedingly astonished and said to him, then who can be saved? Jesus looked at them and said, with men it is impossible, but not with God. For all things are possible with God. Peter began to say to him, Lo, we have left everything and followed you. And Jesus said, Truly, I say to you, there is no one who has left house or brothers or sisters or mother or father or children or lands for my sake and for the gospel, who will not receive a hundredfold now in this time, houses and brothers and sisters and mothers and children and lands with persecution and in the age to come, eternal life. This concludes our reading. This is the word of God. I believe it's true. The grass withers and the flower fades, but the word of our God shall stand forever. I lift this theme to God our preaching on this morning, and I pray that the word of God will bless you through these verses of scripture that have been read in search for real life, in search for real life. <clears throat> Good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? This is the question of the man in the text. And this is the question of everyone who seeks to serve in ways that will strengthen their relationship with God. We have a full composition of the man who asked the question by referencing the other gospels that tell the same story. Matthew 19 and 20 says he was young 
Luke 18 and 18 says he was a ruler. Mark 10 and 22 says he had great possessions. When taken together, we get the picture that this is the rich young ruler. That he is a person by all, by all surface reasoning, he has everything. Maybe we can assume that his wealth is generational because he says, what must I do to inherit eternal life? That what he possesses has come by way of legacy or endowment, maybe birthright. It's, it's been passed down. Therefore, maybe he has placed eternal life in the category of something that could be bequest. What is interesting, or uh, it could be a matter of interpretation, is that his inheritance has not made him indifferent. What we see is a person who is not yet settled. He remains in search for something more. The text says that he came running to Jesus. He is impetuous and undignified, breaking all the stereotypes of his ruling class. Even his humility is on display as he knelt down before Jesus, thus making his question more serious and searching. What must I do to inherit eternal life? After Jesus moves past redirecting good back to God, he says to the young ruler, keep the commandments. Do not kill. Do not commit adultery. Do not steal. Do not bear false witness. Do not defraud. Honor your father and mother. The man replied, I have kept these from my youth up. That his life has been an example of duty, devotion, and the discipline of obedience. There is nothing in the exchange that gives us any indication that he has abused his wealth, nor the systems of his religious practice. The text at this point says, Jesus looking upon him loved him and said to him, you lack one thing. Go sell what you have and give to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven and come follow me. At that saying, his countenance fell, and he went away sorrowful, for he had great possessions. I guess I was caught off guard by the words of Jesus in verse 21. You lack one thing. I've been looking at a man who appeared to lack nothing who by every sense of a reasonable resume has everything and then some. And when Jesus says to him, go sell what you have and give to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven and come follow me. He walked away sorrowful because his whole life had been a, one of managing his inheritance. That whatever the family inheritance has been, he has managed it. 
And I might add, he has managed it well. Even the commandments given by Moses has been a way for him to manage his life. You see, his strength is in his ability to be in control. And if any of this happens to disappear, he may not have anything to do. We have to remember what he said at the beginning. What must I do to inherit eternal life? He understands his value in terms of doing. That he is, he is a manager of the estate and he is the sole manager of his life. And so I ask this question, how many people do you know We've gone to the doctor with an issue or two, shared their concerns with the doctor, only to have the doctor define what the problem is, give some difficult instructions to follow for their cure, and they walk away saddened by the prescription, vowing to get a second opinion. Uh, I lift this up before you today, brothers and sisters. Not only do we walk away from a doctor's advice, but we also walk away from the instructions of Jesus. Um, and so I thought I was looking at a a perfect life that I saw a perfectly managed life but what I saw and what Jesus saw was two different things however before we go too far in being critical of the rich young ruler we really need to take a look at ourselves and so I ask, what's, what, what, what has been the hard saying of Jesus in your life that has caused you to walk away for a minute? I'm encouraged that so many walk away, but they do return. Uh, we're not privileged to have that episode of returning, but Many do walk away at the hard sayings of Jesus, but after having given an opportunity to think through it, they do make their way back. But before we go all in on the rich young ruler, think for a minute, what has been the hard saying from the word of God to you that has caused you to walk away sorrowfully was it a vocation was was it a habit was it a sinful passion was it a relationship my my list ends there but those of you who are listening, there may be some other things that you can add to it. But I think all of us at some place and point in our lives have been the rich young ruler. That when challenged by the word of God, we find it too difficult for us. That when the man walks away from Jesus, he, he is saying that what you are asking of me I can't do right now this this rich young ruler is saying that what you have proposed I'm not ready to pay yet that he discovered that there is really a high cost to discipleship that 
being a disciple of Jesus cost. There are no free ride for any of us when we say we've decided to make Jesus our choice. There's something else here that the man's wealth conferred upon him status and power. That his wealth was a sign of his success. And it is Jesus that really lifts this issue of economic inequality. That it is Jesus who mentions the poor. And he says, sell what you have and give to the poor. Jesus says that because Jesus understands that the poor are worthless. They have no status. They have no position. They have no power. Brothers and sisters, uh, America with all of her wealth can't seem to address this issue of poverty. In this country, there are over 40 million people living in, in poverty. And this pandemic has put our beloved country on display almost in an embarrassing kind of way that when we thought we were one thing, the cover has been pulled off and, and the true America is now on display. And that there are more than seven million persons who have been infected with COVID-19. Sad to mention that there are over 210,000 people who have lost their lives and, and the count is still growing. That there is really just too much that's happening in our nation to put in one sermon. And I'll tell you, it's so troubling. It's so hard to keep up with people who are suffering and the suffering finds its way first to the poor. Through the pandemic, there has been job loss, businesses put on hold, grieving families, the exposure of all of the structural inequalities. And that seems to be the plight of our beloved America. You know, maybe about a week ago, there was a COVID-19 breakout in the White House, which is really the people's house. But these days, it looks more like the president's house. Uh, but for the taxpayers, we know that that is that is our house. But this infectious disease ran rampant through the White House, so much so that the people who even worked there didn't want to come to work. We saw them disinfecting every room uh, in, in the White House. And then on yesterday, uh, when there was this gathering on the White House lawn. I peeped in on it. I wasn't really interested, but I peeped in on it because I, I wanted to see who was going to show up to this infectious place. You and I both know that, that COVID has infiltrated the black and brown communities, devastating black and brown people that what COVID has done to black and brown people uh, is uh, an indication of the uh, care that black and brown people just don't get because they are poor. 
And as I looked at my television screen, I thought that the people who were going to show up at the White House on yesterday would have been his diehard supporters. And much to my surprise, the people who surrounded the White House were black and brown people. The people that COVID has attacked, attacked the hardest are the people who risk their lives running to a place where there is severe spread. And I just wonder how they ended up with an invitation to be on the grounds at the White House. Maybe it's because others uh, reneged on the invitation. Maybe others who were practicing now safe distance and washing hands, wearing face masks, saying that this is not the time to be seen at the White House. And so it's amazing to me how all of this continues to unfold even in this story of the rich young ruler. And brothers and sisters, I need to tell you that what Jesus said, said to the rich young ruler, uh, had that been said in the 21st century, it would have given him the distinction of being called a populist. He would be accused of pushing populist economics. That is human care for all. But I might also say that, that even the Jesus of the 21st century has not changed his message. Jesus did say feed the hungry. Jesus did say clothe the naked. Jesus said, visit those who are in prison for as much as you have done it to the least of these, you've done it unto me. And so I, I, I didn't really plan to be before you long today. I stand to make my point and after my point is made, I find my seat. This, this last thing that this young ruler, brothers and sisters, he is unwilling to accept this radical invitation to divest from his possessions and in return invest in the least of these First of all, it does not make him what you call indecent. But what I do want you to know is that the cost right now is just something he's not willing to pay. That his present life with the status that comes with it, the possessions that he has, really right now is more than the eternal life that he thought he wanted. What he has now is more uh, in his own thinking than the treasure he would have in heaven or this treasure that Jesus is talking about. Maybe you can almost hear the rich young ruler saying, a bird in hand is better than two in the bush. That in Matthew 19, in Luke 18 and in Mark 10 that it's interesting that the story of the rich young ruler is told after in all three of these gospels the story of the rich young ruler is told after the story where Jesus blesses the children and in those stories, and I know you're going to read it when you, when you go, when, you, when the telecast is, is over. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Jesus says, let the little children come unto me, for such is the kingdom of God. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. 
Assuredly, I say to you, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God as a little child will by no means enter it. That we are to receive the kingdom of God joyfully and trustingly. We are to receive the kingdom of God without question because that's how a child received it. A child, brothers and sisters, is innocent and humble and dependent that a child places that trust ultimately in the hands of the parent or provider. And so the story was placed right there, uh, uh, right before the story of the rich young ruler to demonstrate what he could not do. And what he could not do was to give himself over to the charge of God like a child because he was too busy being in charge of his own life. That like a child, he couldn't, he couldn't trust that God was able to take care of him and was able to do something with his possessions. Bless his high name. And so we have we have Peter who makes this statement because the disciples are watching this very closely. And Peter, in essence, says that if this guy, based upon his lifestyle, based upon his credentials, based upon who we believe him to be, if this guy cannot be saved, then who can? Uh, and so it gives me an opportunity uh, from glaring exegetically at this text to just simply say to my brothers and sisters is that we don't come into the kingdom by being a good person. You have to be more than a, than a good person. That that eternal life is not achieved by, by human efforts. You, you cannot work for it. You, you can't achieve it. You, you can't purchase it. You, you can't be good enough. And so when you look at it like that, from a human perspective, it is impossible. But you gotta remember, God will have the last word. And what seems to be impossible for you and I is possible for God, but you got to trust him. And, and Peter saw what the rich young ruler could not divest from. He saw what he could not leave and thought about his own situation and circumstance. And Peter said, we've left everything to follow you. It's almost as if Peter is saying to Jesus, since we left everything to follow you, now what's in it for us? Since we're already, already here. And Jesus says that there is no one who has left houses, and brothers or sisters or mothers or fathers, children or land for my sake or the gospel who will not receive a hundredfold now in this time houses and brothers and sisters and mothers and children and lands and in the age to come eternal life yes Lord I gotta find my seat now but I, I really want you to get this that when we're talking about the kingdom of God that reciprocity is built into the structure. That there is nothing that you and I will ever give to God and to the kingdom where God will not give it back to you. Yeah, a hundredfold. That your harvest is gonna always be bigger than your seed. You, you, you got to understand that God always flips things that the first shall be last 
and the last shall be first. But you got to learn how to trust him. You got to give your life to him. And whatever demands he places upon you, you got to know that God has already looked around the corner and he can see what you and I cannot see. I love him today. No one has done more for us than God. God, God is a giver himself. Yes, he is. He's a giver himself. And he gave us the very best that he had. He gave us Jesus Christ, who came, bled, suffered, and died. He hung out on that tree called Calvary, hung his head and died. They put him in a borrowed tomb. But early, I gotta get on out your way now. I gotta get on out, cause I feel something here. Early the third day morning, he got up. Didn't he get up? You ought to look around your house this morning and testify to what you know. You ought to tell the people around you, I know he got up. He got up for you and he got up for me. He got up with all power, heaven and earth in his hand. I can truly say, hallelujah, that the Lord has made a way and he keeps on making a way for you and I. You want real life? Get Jesus. You want a change in your life? Get Jesus. Yeah, he'll pick you up and he'll turn you around. He'll place your feet on solid ground. I'm glad I know him for myself. He's a bridge over troubled waters. He's a way out of no way. He knows how to fix you when you can't fix yourself. Do you know him? Good morning, Shalom Church family. I'm Deacon Karen McMurray, and it's giving time in our worship service, one of my favorite times in worship, where we get to express to God just how good he's been. In Psalm 116, the psalmist actually raises a question like that. He says, what shall I render unto God for all of his benefits towards me? And when I think about that, my answer to that, I answered 30 years ago in college, I first gave him my life. And then secondly, the other way I, I learned that I could really bless God and show him my love was through my giving, uh, particularly to my local church. So my motivation for giving has very little to do with God commanding us to do so or because our pastor says so. It is, it's, it's an act of love and worship for me. So I'm, I'm just so very grateful just to be able to do so. And in addition, during this COVID season, because um, I own my own business and um, my revenues are down, I'm actually giving more. I, not because I have it, but because I believe Malachi 3.10 is true, that if we bring our tithes to the storehouse, that God will... Uh, open up the windows of heaven and pour me out a blessing that I won't have room enough to receive. And so we can all take advantage of that promise of God that if we give, he's going to multiply it, not just financially, but however he sees fit to meet our needs. So I encourage you, Shalom Church family, this is not the time to be stingy in our giving, but we want to give out of cheerful and grateful hearts. Um, and secondly, I want Shalom Church to be here when, I, when the pandemic is over. We want our pastor and those who are diligently working in the office to still be there. We want our doors to be open to receive not just us, but others in the community who've been hurt and impacted by the pandemic, the social unrest, and they're going to need a place to go. And we want to make sure that Shalom is right there front and center 
to meet that need. The other thing, church family, um, there's so many ways to give. We can give uh, via your uh, text messaging for all of you young people who are really good with the with texting. There's online giving. You can go to shalomccop.org. Um, there's also uh, mail. You can mail in your tithes and offerings. Or if you just want to see somebody face to face, you can drop it off during the business hours of the church. So if you're interested in all of the different ways of giving and how they work, go to the website, shalomccop.org. Uh, it's all there. And lastly, family, we want to encourage you to stay together. In the famous words of Al Green, uh, we stay together when we worship together on Sunday morning. So don't miss the live stream. We want you to pray together, take advantage of the uh, the prayer lines daily, Monday through Saturday, 6 p.m. to 7 p.m. We want us to study together. Yes, Bible study still going on, live stream, Wednesdays, 7 p.m. We're also encouraging ministry groups to uh, host Zoom meetings or conference calls. Again, just to have some fun, to pray with one another, just to make sure everybody's okay. So family, know that I love you. I miss you, and I just look forward to when we're able to see each other face to face. Thank you, and shalom. Thank you.